Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here today. Oh, a little closer? OK. How's that sound? OK. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to start by recognizing the land that we are on. Um, the lands that you are, we are all gathered here today are the lands historically of the Awaswa-speaking Ohlone tribe known as the Oipi tribe. Um, the, the village site that we are close by here, by the mouth of San Lorenzo, was called Avlintak, which is, uh, translates to being the place of the red abalone. Um, I want to start by pointing out uh, maybe the obvious, but uh, I am not native to California. Uh, my ancestors do not call this land their homeland, uh, as is probably the case with a lot of people who are out here. Um, and I want to point out that as a guest living on these beautiful lands, I was born and raised in California, lived in Santa Cruz for over 20 years now. Uh, like so many here, I am a guest on these lands. And so I feel that it is incumbent upon myself and upon all of us to learn about the histories and the people whose lands that we are on today, uh, to stand in solidarity with the local native communities, uh, and most importantly, to listen to and learn from native people today. Uh, right now, today, we have this wonderful opportunity, uh, the incredible lineup that you're about to be hearing from and we started hearing from, uh, but we have indigenous leaders who are coming in from all up and down the state, uh, many of whose ancestors have survived uh, the missions, um, as has been said before. But as a historian, what I would like to do is just offer a little bit of context uh, and the best that I can do is to offer context and to help amplify the voices uh, that we have to learn from these native voices that are here. So there's a little bit of a historical context. In 1906, a group of women's clubs, automobile clubs, and California boosters uh, worked together to, with a plan to build tourism. Uh, and this, uh, what they came up with was this plan to put together these bell markers along this fabled and invented El Camino Real, which of course was really built on old native highways and travelways and trade routes. So these folks in 1906, they turned to the Franciscan scholars who at the time were the ones who were telling the official story of California history. Uh, and of course, this official story we know today and we knew back then is a fabricated mythology. It's a romanticized notion of California history, uh, which is all a fancy way to say it's lies, all lies. So when these folks turned to the Franciscan scholars to try to tell this history, uh, a lot of people will say, well, the Native people weren't telling these stories, which of course is not true either, because at the same time in 1906 that this was happening, Native people were sharing their stories, were recording their stories, were talking about what really did happen. They just weren't being listened to. Um, so I want to, especially not by the people who are making the bell markers. So what they told was a whole different story. A lot of what they told was how they were treated at the missions, which was comparable to being treated like animals, which is to actually say more accurately, they were treated the same way that the Spanish settlers were treating their livestock, because of course Native people had a different relationship with animals than the Spanish did. So I'm going to give a little context here of Santa Cruz. We are standing right in the spot where Mission Santa Cruz was. Uh, I think it's important for people to realize the devastation and loss that happened right here. There was about 2,500 Native people who received baptism at Mission Santa Cruz from 1791 at its founding until the close of the mission in 1830s. At the time of the closing of the mission, when people were finally emancipated uh, from the mission, there was just over 200 people. Out of the 2,500 people, when you do the math, that means that over 90% of the people who received baptism at Mission Santa Cruz, Native people, died during that period of time. On top of that, 
when I did research and looked at the children who were born within the mission, so this is Native children, there was just under 500 Native children born during those that period, 40-year period. And of those nearly 500 children, over 50% of them did not survive to the age of one. And on top of that, another 25% did not survive to the age of five, which means over 75% of the children, Native children born at the mission here, died before, well, in infancy, right, before the age of five. Um, and comparatively, of course, those numbers are atrocious compared to what was happening right outside of the mission. So this idea that the missions brought anything positive or helped people is, of course, completely inaccurate. It doesn't stand up. So here at Mission Santa Cruz, there was one, one survivor, one of the, the few who survived here was a fellow named Lorenzo Asisara. Um, and he actually lived, we stand right here, he actually lived in a house in the 1860s uh, that is kind of right up there, probably underneath where Highway 17 runs uh, with a fellow, a friend of his uh, named Ricardo Shuklan was his native name, uh, who was a, had been the former song leader at the mission. Uh, they were part of the surviving community around here. And Asisara gave a number of interviews in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, he actually lived till right about the same time that these mission bell markers uh, were being made. He died in the early 1900s. He was a survivor of the missions. Um, and the story that he told, I think is pertinent because we're here in Santa Cruz, but the story that Asisara shared were very different, of course, than these romanticized fables that you're hearing uh, that we've all been taught over the years. Uh, Asisara talked about uh, Padre Quintana, who was here at Mission Santa Cruz. And this is a sadistic missionary who was here who had a special whip fashioned with iron at the tips so that it would cut deeper when he punished people with his whippings, which was frequent. Um, but Quintana was not an isolated case. Some people say, well, okay, that was one bad apple or whatever the saying might be. Of course, that's not the case. Asisada talked about a lot of different situations, a lot of different missionaries who committed these awful abuses. In one story, he talked about a young couple who were trying to conceive a, conceive a child and they were unable to. And so Padre Olbez forced the couple to have sex in front of him. He inspected their bodies. He, again, treating people like livestock, like animals uh, in this dehumanizing way. But I think it's important to recognize that Asisada didn't just talk about traumas and abuses that happened here. He certainly talked about those, but he really emphasized the way that people fought back and that they challenged these. In the case of Padre Quintana, a group of young men and women got together and they said, what are we going to do? And they ended up assassinating him. They took him out because he was causing these abuses. Yeah. In the case of this, this young couple, they, he, Asisada talked about how they fought back, how the woman clawed at him and cut his face uh, because she was forced into this. Again, the emphasis was on the ways that, that people fought back and that they, they resisted this dehumanizing treatment and they asserted their rights and their humanity, uh, even in these unbearable odds. Um, and I'm gonna wrap this up here because I think there's so many amazing speakers I wanna get to, but I just wanna kind of get to that point here that at every mission, uh, at every place in California, within every tribal community, they have these same stories, right? And these stories have not been told, right? Or at least not been shared outside of uh, the native communities that know these stories uh, because it's been dominated by this other romanticized story. But it's time for us to, to learn these stories and to understand the ways that people got together and that they fought and resisted and they challenged uh, their oppressions and all that they had to deal with. And when you're gonna see all these uh, amazing native leaders who are coming up here, uh, today, just keep that in mind that they are carrying on these same traditions. They're doing the same thing today by persisting, by challenging, and by asserting their own rights uh, to be here. And so it is our opportunity right now to be able to listen to and learn from uh, these Native leaders. And I hope that we can all do that here today. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>